Okay, uh, Nora, you're ready. I think uh, mm -hmm. we can we can start now. So uh, then, a warm welcome to to everyone for joining this webinar arranged by the Structural Geology Network Group of Force. Uh, my name is Aina Sverdrup. I'm acting, acting as the current uh, network leader. Uh, the presentation today will be by Nora Holden. And the title of her talk is Structural Characterization and Cross-Fault Assessment of the Aurora CO2 Storage Site, Northern North Sea. And this uh, presentation is from Nora's uh, master project that she completed in June this year. Um, the Aurora study is part of the Northern Light project of storing CO2 with a planned start in uh, 2024. And Nora's talk will focus on the structural evolution of the Aurora area, fault seal assessments, and the importance of faults for potential CO2 leakage uh, and storage. And we are, of course, curious about her findings and, and conclusions. Nora is currently a PhD research fellow at the Norwegian Carbon Capture and Storage Research Center and the University of Oslo. Uh, please note that uh, the talk uh, will be recorded and uh, that you're kindly asked to hold your questions and comments until Nora has finished her presentation. You may also submit questions in the chat that I will try to pick up in the end. Let's see how that goes. So by this, I will ask you, Nora, to please take over and start mm -hmm. your presentation. Thank you. So thank you for the introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, present uh, our work here at FORCE. And I hope you all can see my presentation and hear me uh, well. So as I um, mentioned, this is part or was part of my master project and is now uh, the first PhD activity that I'm working on. So this is a work in progress and any questions and comments are uh, appreciated. Uh, so just to um, mention the title is Structural Characterization and a Cross-Fault Seal Assessment of the Aurora CO2 Storage Site. And this is a work in collaboration with people from the University of Osma, uh, Oslo. So it's Jonathan Osmond, Mark Mulrooney, Alvar Bråten and Anja Sundal and Elin Skutwright from NGI. So just to start uh, with mentioning some CCS operations in uh, Norway. Norway has a quite uniquely long experience when it comes to carbon capture and storage. So we've been capturing CO2 for 25 years uh, at the Snövit and the Schleifner fields. In two quite uh, new and recent reports, by um, uh, new and important reports by IPCC and IEA, they state that we cannot reach our climate targets without CCS technologies. And therefore, Norway is now planning the first ever full chain uh, open uh, access uh, open sourced and cross open uh, cross border CCS operation in just a couple of uh, years. So the entire project has been called the uh, Longship or Longship by the Norwegian government. And in the first phases of Longship, they will capture uh, CO2 from industrial plants, and this is Nordsem and potentially uh, Fortum, transport it by ship to Øygarn and then by pipeline out to the North Sea and down into the subsurface. So the transport and storage aspect of a long ship will be led by the Northern Light project, which is an industry collaboration between Equinor, Total and Shell. So as Einar mentioned, uh, our project is part of NCCS or the Norwegian CCS Research Center. And this is a center for environment friendly energy research or an FME, which started in 2016 and will run until 2024. So NCCS is financed by the Research Council and we also have many industry and research partners, which you see at the bottom of the slide here. 
So the overall aim of NCCS is to work alongside the industry to help fast track CCS deployments in Norway and in Europe and in the, the world. So NCCS, it consists of 12 tasks ranging from legal aspects to um, capture technology, chemistry, engineering, and also subsurface uh, assessment and geology. So we're part of this task nine in NCCS called structural de-risking, where we focus on uh, structural features in the subsurface, such as faults and their influence on CO2 migration and storage integrity. Uh, task nine is led by Elin Skutveit from uh, NGI and Alvar Bråten is our UIO representative. So the current focus uh, for CO2 storage and injection is uh, the exploitation license EL001, also called uh, Aurora. So Aurora, you can see the outline in the figure here. It's located just south of the troll fields on the Hodda platform and approximately 60 kilometers west of uh, Bergen and Naturgasparken. Uh, so in the first phase of the Northern Light project, they aim to store one and a half megatons of CO2 per year with the potential to upscale to five megatons of CO2 each year. And just as a comparison, five megatons of CO2 per year is approximately 10% of Norway's annual CO2 uh, emission. So a couple of years ago, the, in 2019, the North Light project, they drilled this EOS well, uh, 3157 within Aurora. And the plan is to re-enter a sidetrack and use this well as a CO2 injector. Uh, the EOS well also found a suitable storage complex within the Lower Jurassic Tunneling Group. And by storage complex, we mean storage aquifer so unit and the sealing uh, unit. Aurora is quite a faulted um, area, as much of the Hodda platform uh, is. You have these large scale fault zones called Tusse and uh, Svartalv that intersects the storage complex within Aurora. And in addition, you have numerous uh, smaller scale intra-block faults that you see, see here. So the overall project goal um, that we have been working on is to increase knowledge on how faults within Aurora will influence CO2 migration. And to achieve this, we performed structural characterization, so interpretation and modeling of uh, faults and assessment of fault geometries. We assessed the presence of two types of cross fault seals called juxtaposition seals and membrane seals. And then we used the results to discuss potential CO2 migration pathways and gross work volume of structural traps. So the data that I uh, applied is um, open uh, access data from Gasnova, which you see the outline and stippled uh, black lines in the figure, and also 2D seismic and well data. We also focused in on a slightly smaller area, uh, which is uh, shown in a black uh, solid line, to have include most of the structural uh, features surrounding this E as well. And we also applied an in-house velocity model to perform the depth uh, conversion. So many of you are probably very familiar with the geology of uh, the Hodna platform and the North Sea, but just as a quick introduction, we often say we have two major rift events that led to the formation of the Honda platform. The first during Permian to Triassic, and then a period of relative tectonic uh, quiescence during Middle Triassic to Middle Jurassic, and then renewed rifting in Middle Jurassic to Early Cretaceous. So these rift phases led to the formation of the present day architecture of the Hoda platform. You can see an example in the bottom of the slide here. So you have these large scale um, first order faults that intersect the basement. And two of them are the Svartal fault zone and Tusse fault zone that uh, also intersect the Aurora license. These bound uh, predominantly Permian to Jurassic sediments and are overlain by Cretaceous to Cenozoic uh, sediments. 
During this second rift phase, you, we reactivated or uh, it re reactivated the first order faults and also formed these second order faults uh, without basement involvement. So to describe the lower Jurassic storage complex in a bit more uh, detail. So the storage complex uh, within Aurora is within this Dunlin, lower Jurassic Dunlin group, which was deposited during this uh, inter-rift phase. Uh, the storage units are within the Johansson formation and the Cook formation, and then the Drake formation serves as a primary uh, seal. So what we did for our project is to interpret Johansson uh, as the primary storage aquifer or storage unit, uh, Cook as the secondary storage aquifer, and then these lower mudrich parts of the Drake formation as the primary seal. So as you see from the figures here, uh, this means that this uh, small Amundsen formation is also included in the storage aquifers. And uh, this is because Amundsen is not um, continuous throughout the study area and cannot serve as a primary seal. And it's also uh, relatively thin um, and below the vertical resolution of the, of the seismic applied. Uh, so to give some introduction into how we assess the influence of faults on CO2 migration, we first want to interpret the storage complex, the thickness of uh, the ceiling unit and the continuity of the storage complex. We then assess fault geometry, so strike, dip and throw, which plays important role in the influence of the faults on migration of CO2. And then we perform the assessment of across fault seals, which we call juxtaposition seals and membrane seals. And to give a quick introduction to what we mean by juxtaposition seal, uh, you can see at scenario one, you have this higher permeability, higher porosity storage unit that becomes juxtaposed against a lower permeability, lower porosity seal unit. If the throw of the fault exceeds the thickness of the seal and the overlying successions also are a higher permeability, higher porosity, we don't consider this uh, scenario to be sealing. Uh, scenario three is just to show that the, the dip of a fault relative to the inject injector well will um, play an important role. So while this is considered a juxtaposition seal, if the injector is located in the hanging wall, we don't consider this fault to be uh, sealing. So we also have a second type of a cross fault seal that we call a membrane seal. And this is when the fault itself um, holds sealing potential. And there are many mechanisms that can least, uh, lead to reduced permeability within the fault zone, such as uh, deformation bands, cementation, and the presence of clay smear. Uh, most publications from the North Sea consider clay smear to be the uh, dominant factor that leads to permeability reduction and sealing potential of faults. So that's why we, uh, in this project, assess the presence of clay smear. So we cannot directly see clay smears in seismic, and we usually don't have uh, wells that intersect a fault. So, and that's why we use these algorithms to, um, to uh, see the likelihood that a membrane seal is present along a fault. Um, and this uh, algorithm, the most commonly used one, is a shale gouge ratio algorithm, where we use the volumetric clay fraction from, in this case, the gamma ray log, the thickness of uh, clay rich units and divided by, by the throw. So the resulting SGR value holds no meaning and that's why we compare it to uh, known SGR values of known leaking and sealing faults. So this is the uh, calibration from yielding in 2002, where we see that uh, SGR values lower than 15 to 20% represents leaking faults and SGR values exceeding 15 to 20% represents a uh, ceiling fault. So that's it for an uh, uh, introduction to the project and some theoretical concepts. So the remaining will be from, uh, on results uh, from our project. This first slide shows a 
two cross sections going through this study area uh, and this E as well. So in the east-west cross section, the storage complex is represented by the three bottom blue units here. And we see that it forms this slight uh, anticline and that the area just east of the uh, EOS well is intersected by numerous faults. In the north-south cross section, uh, we see that the storage complex is dipping towards the south. And because CO2 is buoyant, we would expect it to migrate northwards and encounter uh, these uh, thin-skinned or second-order faults. And then finally, this larger uh, Svartal fault zone, which offsets our um, storage complex. And from this um, uh, little map in the corner here, we also see that it will eventually migrate out of the Aurora license and then into uh, Troll. And in this figure, you see the uh, top of the Cook formation, which is the top of the secondary storage uh, unit. You have the depth structure map, the variance attribute map, and the fault trace and interaction map. So most of the interpreted surfaces within the um, uh, storage complex shows relatively similar results to this, with deepening towards the, the south and then shallowing towards the north. So if we expect CO2 to migrate more or less perpendicular to these contour lines, the CO2 plume will encounter the Svartal fault zone in the footwall, potentially migrate into the hanging wall or follow um, along the footwall and into the troll license. From the variance uh, attribute map, we also see that this area just east of the EOS well has a higher density of faults and that the faults are curving and linking up with this Svartal fault segment uh, towards the north, potentially creating structural traps. Uh, the final figure shows uh, the up and down section extent of my interpreted uh, faults. So some of the faults, especially Svartalv and Tussa, they go down into the basement, while the remainder in the tip out within Triassic successions down section. Uh, most of these uh, faults also tip out within Cretaceous or Jurassic successions up, uh, up section. So they're all intersecting and displacing uh, the storage units and seal. Uh, so here you have the thickness of um, the primary storage, which is primarily the Johansson formation, secondary storage, which is the Cook formation, and the primary seal unit, which is this lower part of Drake. Uh, we can see that the units are relatively tabular. They show some thickness uh, variations, but there is no sign of uh, significant thinning, erosion, or non-deposition. So the primary storage unit is a bit thicker than our secondary storage, and then the primary seal is relatively tabular and measures on average 80 meters uh, in thickness. Uh, so to summarize uh, my fault interpretations, so I interpreted in around 70 faults within this uh, study area and then categorized them into these two uh, fault populations, the first order faults and second order faults. So first order faults, they're um, west dipping, more or less north-south striking. However, there are some deviations in the, in the strike of the faults. And they have throws uh, ranging from 43 to 900 meters when measured in this top cook or the top storage uh, unit. So some of these faults have throws exceeding the thickness of uh, the primary seal. The second order faults show some variation from primarily north-south trending, just east of the EOS well, to northwest-southeast striking um, towards the north in the footwall of Sartalf. These also have quite lo a lot lower throws, close to the vertical resolution and below the thickness of the primary seal. From the maximum throw, maximum trace length plot, we also see that uh, um, our measurements from within Aurora, which are red squares and the black dots, align well with measurements uh, from the troll field and also other global measurements uh, from Kim and Sanderson. In this uh, figure to the right, I've highlighted three 
faults of uh, the interpreted uh, faults in a, our study area. And these are the faults that I will focus on when it comes to throw assessment, juxtaposition assessment, and the membrane seal assessment. So Svartal is selected because it potentially offsets the storage complex uh, against shallower successions. This northwest-southeast striking fault is selected because it's a representative of numerous of such faults towards the north in the updip migration pathway for CO2. And then this uh, isolated fault is selected because it's located just uh, 700 meters away from the EOS well and will likely be the first uh, that's encountered by the CO2 plume. So to start by showing some um, throw assessment, this is the Svartal fault segment that I just talked about. Uh, you see that you have made uh, the majority of throw is uh, accumulated at the center of the fault and it's approximately 300 meters in the storage complex. So this is uh, the throw exceeds the thickness of this primary seal. You also have these minor throw uh, peaks where it, the um, second order faults interact and hard links uh, with the Svartal in the foot wall. In the section view, we also see that the throw is actually increasing quite a lot down section to a maximum of 900 uh, meters in the basement cover contact. And we also have um, expansion within Triassic and in uh, late Triassic, early Cretaceous, which fits well with what we know of the evolution in the Hoda platform. Uh, the second order northwest southeast striking fault uh, shows a slightly different throw length profile. We have a slightly skewed profile towards the interaction with Svartal, suggesting that we have hard linkage and potentially creating a small structural trap. And we also see that the throw is uh, quite a lot lower and below um, the thickness of the primary seal. In section view, we also see that there's a maximum throw somewhere in the lower Jurassic and then some expansion in the late Jurassic, early Cretaceous. Isolated fault, uh, just 700 meters north of the EOS well, shows quite minor throws compared to the other faults, um, around 30 to 35 uh, meters. And we also see that it tips out towards both edges, uh, suggesting no interaction with nearby, nearby fault. So now to move on to juxtaposition assessment, we know from the throw assessment that Svartalv have throws exceeding the thickness of the primary seal. So we want to see different juxtaposition scenarios across uh, this fault. Um, so we create these Allen diagrams, and this is a close-up of the storage aquifer juxtapositions, where the green solid line and blue solid line indicate the foot wall intersection. Uh, of the storage units with the Svartal fault, and then the dotted lines represents the hanging wall intersection. So this dark red color, it uh, indicates areas where we have sand on mudrich successions or storage against the primary seal. However, we see that in the top parts of um, uh, the storage units, uh, we don't have any juxtaposition seal and uh, our storage is juxtaposed against uh, upper parts of Drake or the Brent group and uh, also the Viking group further north. So for the two second order faults, uh, we see a quite uh, a simpler juxtaposition scenario because these have throws less than the primary seal. It will not offset uh, the storage units against shallower succession. However, it, they, it will create a small juxtaposition seal within the secondary uh, storage unit or this cook formation. Where the primary storage unit is juxtaposed against the secondary storage unit, we have no juxtaposition seal. Uh, so we created this, uh, these juxtaposition or Allen diagrams for around 12 volts within the study area and then summarized them and uh, categorized them into different scenarios. So these two maps shows the top of the primary storage, which is the top of um, Johansen, and the secondary storage, which is the top of uh, Cook Formation. 
And if we assume uh, that uh, injected CO2 will migrate more or less perpendicular to, um, uh, to the contour lines, we can uh, present some plausible CO2 migration pathways. In the primary storage unit, we see that there is mostly sand on sand juxtaposition. So we don't we consider that the second order faults will have a relatively low influence. However, if the plume is located within the cook formation or the secondary storage unit, then uh, these northeast dipping faults could potentially create small uh, baffles within the upper part of the storage. In both scenarios, uh, there is a risk of CO2 migrating across Svartal and into uh, out of the storage complex, uh, storage unit, and into shallower uh, successions. So what we uh, did uh, next is to assess if there are membrane seals uh, present. So these are again the same faults, uh, but now they're populated with calculated SGR values from wells in the foot wall and also in the hanging wall of each fault. And so you see in this area where we have storage units juxtaposed against shallower successions, we have SGR values exceeding at least 30%, which indicate that there is likely membrane seal present in these areas. For the two second order uh, faults, uh, we also see that where the primary storage is juxtaposed against the secondary storage, there is slightly higher SGR values. And this is due to this uh, the presence of this thin Amundsen formation between the two storage units. Uh, so then we've created similar um, uh, SGR scenarios or maps showing different SGR values for the faults within the study area. And we see that in the primary storage, these northeast tipping faults could potentially um, have a baffling effect. However, the SGR values ranges from 15 to 20 percent, which is this cutoff uh, values from the calibration in, in yielding. In both scenarios, the Svartal fault segments have SGR values exceeding 20%, and there, we therefore uh, think that there is likely membrane seal present across this uh, across Svartal, and that CO2 will um, migrate along the footfall of Svartal out of Aurora at Aurora exploitation license and into Troll. Uh, so to zoom into some um, some areas, one near the EOS well and one towards the north in the footwell of Svartal. Um, we see that if, from our results, uh, we see that if the plume is located in the primary storage unit or um, uh, Johansen, then the faults, these secondary faults, will have a lower influence compared to if it's located in, in the secondary storage unit or in Cook. However, in uh, both scenarios, due to the dip of the storage unit, the overall migration route will be towards uh, the north. And of course, now I only talk about how faults will influence migration, and it's important to note that other factors will play an important role. And just to mention a few from Sundal et al. in 2016, uh, heterogeneities in the reservoir will play an important role, the injection scheme, and anisotropine relative permeabilities. Uh, so towards uh, the north in the footwall of this uh, Svartal fault zone, we have these uh, smaller structural traps where second order northeast dipping faults are hard linked with the Svartal fault. And just to give uh, an estimate of how long it will take CO2 to migrate into these traps, I've applied a fluid uh, model from Sundal in 2015 which is also modeled within Johansen and Cook. However, it is uh, modeled quite uh, a bit further south. So if we assume a similar structural dip and similar reservoir qualities, this will take about 150 to 210 years, so long after the end of the troll uh, field life. Uh, these structural, small structural traps, they have a combined cross rock volume of uh, about 68 million cubic meters in the primary storage and 93.6 million cubic meters in the secondary storage. 
And to give a rough estimate of the storage capacity of uh, these small traps uh, by applying the equation from the storage atlas, this equates to 0.23 megatons of CO2. So it's not a large, a large uh, number, but it will contribute to the overall capacity of uh, Aurora. And then just to mention some limitations, uncertainties and other considerations, uh, because of course there are some when we uh, work with seismic data. Um, as you see from the figure to the right here, this Svartalv segment that I've shown in, uh, in multiple slides shows quite uh, some structural complexities uh, along it. You have multiple slip planes and both antithetic and synthetic splays. Um, going out from the, the main interpreted fault in red. So these could influence uh, these um, uh, diagrams and uh, cross-fault seal assessments that we would make. However, the plume will be located in, in the footwall and we consider these complexities to have a, a minor influence on our uh, conclusions. It's also important to note that there are uh, uh, sub-seismic features uh, potentially deformation bands, wide damage zone and process zone, which will um, influence migration of CO2 near the modeled uh, faults. And then it's also important to note that there are limitations in the methods that we apply. Uh, we use this calibration of a known leaking and sealing fault to set the cutoff values of SGR. Uh, however, there are faults that are uh, leaking with a higher than 20% uh, as calculated SGR and it's faults that are sealing with lower. So there are some uncertainties uh, in the method. And also some recent uh, publication have suggested that due to difference in wetting properties of CO2 compared to hydrocarbons, it can be quite challenging to apply such methods that are developed for hydrocarbon fields directly into CO2 storage sites without uh, any modification. Uh, so to summarize uh, our main conclusions and takeaway messages, and mention some takeaway messages, Aurora uh, is faulted, and these faults will likely influence migration of injected CO2. While these second order faults have throws less than the thickness of the primary seal, these east and northeast dipping faults could potentially uh, baffle migration. And while Svartalv a fault zone offsets the storage complex and uh, juxtaposes it against shallower, higher permeability um, units, the calculated SGR values exceed 30%, which suggests that there is a membrane seal present preventing CO2 from migrating out of the storage complex. And in addition, we have these smaller scale structural traps that contribute to the overall storage capacity. So while we uh, conclude that faults can have a positive contribution to uh, storage within Aurora, there are some uncertainties and the highest uncertainty could be related to the presence of membrane seal across this Svartal fault zone. And therefore we think that monitoring will play an important role in, uh, in storage within Aurora. Uh, finally, uh, just to mention some of my plans going forward, I'm quite a new uh, PhD student, so I have some upcoming projects which are all related to CCS and NCCS. Uh, one project will focus on uh, field studies of growth faults in the Floy Canyon, Utah, and assess uh, lateral and vertical movement of growth faults and their implication for fault seals and fluid migration. And then a second project will uh, focus on these uh, fault zone complexities that we also see in Aurora and their implication for CO2 storage. And here we would like to use uh, machine learning techniques to see if we were able to image these complexities uh, better. That's it for um, my presentation. Uh, of course, thank you to our NCCS. Uh, partners and if you have any questions uh, let me know now or please send me an email. Very very good uh, thank you for an uh, excellent uh, talk Nora this was uh, really good and very interesting. 
and uh, we open up for questions and, and comments. Uh, and uh, I can see that we have uh, one hand raised, and that is from Kjersti Webenstad. Would you like mm -hmm. to, to comment or ask? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very good uh, presentation and, and also very good illustrations. Uh, so it was a pleasure to to listen to you, <laughs> Thank you. and uh, I ha I just have a comment, mm. and that is uh, in 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 future when you give this talk, uh, uh, it would be I think you should uh, be clearer on when you say that it will migrate into troll, mm. it will migrate into troll license, mm. and maybe make clear that the troll field is way above. Shallower than than yeah. the um, uh, than the storage complex for uh, for non light. Mm. Um, just I know that we are a bit uh, con we are <laughs> a bit uh, uh, try to be clear on this because in communication to the outer world it's uh, 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 leakage or migration into troll that is not a good idea. <laughs> No, no, that's no. a very good point. Yeah. yeah. So that's the true what you're saying in migration they, into yeah. the troll license. license and we are also uh, 500 yeah. meters below the, the producing troll field. Yes. Thank that's you. That's a good, good clarification. Mm. Okay. And um, before I move to you, Signe, I just have another uh, question here on, on the chat that came in before you. <laughs> mm. It says, uh, uh, to Nora, thank you for the nice presentation. You touched on this point at the end, but I'm curious what density of CO2 you consider in your study and how this compares to the fluids that yielding uh, 2002 is considering in his work. Uh, is his chart cut off of 20% calibrated on both gas, oil, gas only? Question mark. How do the density of these fluids compare to the CO2 density considered in your study? Ah, okay. <laughs> That's a <laughs> good and complicated uh, question. I'm yeah. not sure. Uh, do you, uh, by density of CO2, I guess you mean in the calculation of the storage uh, capacity. And that's just, uh, when I calculated that, that's a very general uh, calculation. I can't remember the exact numbers I, I uh, used now, but I'll be happy to send you an email uh, with all the all the values that I selected for that calculation. Uh, when it comes to yieldings calibration, um, I, I used to think that they are basically or m mainly based on hydrocarbon uh, column heights, but I'm not going to say that uh, for sure. So um, yeah, maybe someone else can give an even more thorough answer to your question. But that's uh, Okay, and then uh, Signe, you have a question or a yes. comment? Hi, Signe Ottesen, Equinor here. Um, as you probably know, I've worked for this area. <laughs> mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you very much for a second opinion and a very good presentation. Um, I wonder if you have it or have you considered using the shale smear factor for uh, for juxtaposition of uh, the storage units to, to shallower units across the Svartalfort. Oh uh, yeah, uh, we did consider it. It's um, we decided not to because it it's not including any of the uh, values from well logs that can be easily translated to uh, fault uh, capacity and um, the height, the column height of CO2. So I haven't looked into shale smear factor or clay smear potential, uh, but that could be something uh, to do, uh, do in the future. Mm, because we consider sort of, you can look at the probability of having a, a complete seal with a clay smear, uh, mm. which of course is the first order of uh, sealing, <laughs> mm. which you also mentioned. So uh, I think, yeah. Mm. Mm, well, that's a good, good point and I will, I will look into it. Definitely. Okay. Mm. okay, and then Eirik uh, Stuland, you have a question. Yes, hi Eirik Stuland from uh, ARCO PP, and thank you for a very nice presentation. 
And as someone else said, that was a very nice illustration. That was very, very clear. Thanks. Um, I just have, a, you know, I don't expect detailed answer on this one, but uh, you mentioned the monit monitoring, yeah? and, mm. and what kind of uh, is it to to check out the the movement of the of the plume, or is it kind of the fault uh, reactivation or any fluid along the fault? What kind of monitoring were you thinking about? Yeah, I think my initial thought is uh, monitoring of the of the plume. But this is um, uh, definitely something I'm going to look more more into. What type of monitoring uh, would be important? But also, like you say, reactivation, um, seismology uh, will also play an important uh, role. Mm. Okay, thanks a lot. Mm. Okay, very good. And we have uh, another question in the chat here. Uh, that is from PB. I'm not quite sure who that is, but uh, thank you for this presentation. Any indication of thief sands in the area, southern part of, uh, in this area, uh, southern part of Troll? Um, that's from uh, Per Buck. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's not something I've, I've looked into, but there are some some people that look more in detail into the stratigraphy and. Um, yeah, the potential for a thief sense, but that's uh, has not been part of uh, of my project. Okay, I think uh, that was uh, all the questions I have recorded uh, so far. And anyone else? No. Just a oh. question, Aina, about uh, you said this will be recorded. Will it be uh, available after? Then we have to ask uh, the Secretariat how this is uh, available. Yeah. Uh, Lynn, can you comment upon that? Yes, um, the the recording of this will be posted on the FORCE YouTube uh, site and on the FORCE website under available presentations. And if if Nora wants to share your presentation, I can add that on there as well. Mm. Yeah. So sometime next week, um, the recording and everything will be posted. Mm. Yeah, OK, thanks. And then we have another question from Andrew uh, about uh, cataclysis is not included in this study, question mark. Uh, no, yeah, uh, I guess I briefly mentioned that uh, cataclysis or uh, disaggregation bands can can form and uh, has likely formed, but no, it's not part of the uh, assessment in this seismic study. But that's something we want to look more into in, in Utah in field and outcrop. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's nice. And uh, Attila, uh, Patrick asks about, do you plan to investigate the, the re reactivation potential of these faults in the Aurora field? Um, not currently. That's definitely an interesting uh, follow-up project. Um, yeah, so I have, uh, as part of the master mm. thesis, um, I uh, looked into uh, fault activity and potential reorientation of rift, um, rift axis. But that's um, yeah, not included in this project, but potentially in the future. Yes, and then from uh, Jonathan Osman, do you mm -hmm. think your results also inform us about the fault seal in the Lumre Terrace? Uh, potentially, uh, I don't have, um, I haven't looked that much into uh, to the Lumre Terrace. But um, I know it's a focus for exploration at the moment, and yeah, some of the results could potentially be translated to to that area as well if the if the reservoirs are within uh, lower Jurassic uh, successions. Yeah. Okay. I think we are through with the questions then thanks mm -hmm. again Nora. very good uh, very good and interesting talk so um, if there are uh, no more comments or questions uh, before you leave i've been asked to advertise a lunch and learn webinar from a newly established uh, force group 
which is the carbon capture and storage group. So it's uh, related, of course, to, to this talk. And uh, <coughs> this group will then arrange a webinar series that kicks off uh, next month. And I will I will show you on my screen just uh, just a moment. Uh, let's see if I can uh, find it uh, here. Um, here it is. So just uh, be patient a um, second. Let's see. Uh, here. So you can see my screen now and you can see that uh, the, the next uh, or the first talk is actually this December 7th by Elin Skutweit, which is also uh, one colleague of Nora. So she will talk about the overview of subsurface research activities for carbon storage on the Norwegian continental shelf. So I guess that's also something that would be, <coughs> would be interesting for you to, to listen to. Uh, OK, so uh, by that, uh, I would uh, thank you again. And uh, yeah, well, there are a couple of more questions. I don't know if you can see them, Nora. <laughs> uh, Sorry, no, um, yeah. No, OK, mm -hmm. so you get a lot of credit for, for what you have been uh, through now. So thanks for a fantastic presentation. Mm -hmm. Nice presentation, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have, is the suggested northern directed migration purely conceptual or has there been any fluid flow modeling uh, or any fluid flow modeling been done? Uh, yeah, I, I, have, I have not done any fluid uh, modeling, but that would also be a uh, uh, an interesting uh, further project. Uh, so that's more conceptual based on structural features, based on uh, fault seals. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. And uh, thanks a lot. And thanks for all of you who have attended this one. I think it was a very, very good talk. And uh, good luck with your PhD project, Nora. Thank you. Mm -hmm.